Hey everyone, this is Pamela Coey. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I want to thank Mark Arts of Wichita, Kansas for inviting me to jury their abstract national exhibition. There were 978 entries and it was a very large task. What follows is my artist talk that describes a little bit about art history that led up to this exhibition, as well as how I juried the show. So I hope you enjoy the artist talk. Good evening. Um, thank you all for staying tonight for tonight's Artist Talk. I'm Katie Dora with Mark Arts, and we are honored to have you with us this evening. Um, we were really, it's been a joy to work with Pam on this exhibition and to see the amount of awe her students have been in throughout today and this process. She is a gifted artist and instructor, and we are all going to learn some ma marvelous things from Pamela tonight. Um, her work, as you know, has been inspiration for our students and our instructors and many of the artists that have traveled from across the country to be part of the two-day workshop here at Mark Arts. Um, as mentioned previously, Pam has her Master's of Fine Arts in Painting and Drawing from the University of Montana School of Art and has special interest in cold wax and oil, encaustic, mixed media, and acrylic. She is a full-time studio artist and teaches workshops from her Hamilton, Montana studio and across the country. Everyone, please help me in welcoming Pamela to Mark Arts. Well, uh, I want to just say thank you again to Mark Arts for this um, amazing uh, opportunity to be here, um, to be the juror for the show. I was really blown away by the uh, submissions, and I'm also like really so happy to see these lovely people in the workshop because I know many of them, and uh, it's been a pleasure. So let me get started here. Now, I, I will look to the side here. Abstract National Exhibition, and uh, so that's one of my works there. And I first want to congratulate all artists who entered. And if you're an artist who entered, uh, got in or didn't get in, could you just raise your hand so I can kind of see? Ooh, wonderful. And thank you for coming tonight because I know the snow has kept some people away and some people flew in to be here. So I think that's really amazing and it says a lot for Mark Arts. So whether your work was selected or not, you are definitely to be congratulated. Going through the process of submission is a major task. It requires many skills, attention to detail, commitment to your artistic journey, and belief in yourself. So I want to congratulate all of you who had that courage, because we need artists to have courage so that we can have a show like this. Well, so a little background about me. On the left is University of Wisconsin in Madison. I grew up in Wisconsin, and um, I got a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry in 1983. That satisfied the left side of my brain, and biochemistry was never really right for me. But three decades later, I then went back to college and got my MFA in painting in 2010 at the University of Montana in Missoula, and that was a better, a better fit for me. I also have an online art school, which I'm really grateful for because of the students that I have in it. They make me so happy. They're my, my happy family, and uh, most of them found me on YouTube. My voice sounds different on YouTube because I don't have a cold on YouTube. <laughs> And then there's just some, some slides of my work. I do work in four mediums, so I'm a very experimental artist, and I would just say that my art has gone through a lot of different uh, evolutions, and I, as I teach, I, I encourage my students to evolve and, and not be so hard on themselves, because art is a lifelong process. It's a journey. It's never about the destination, and I, I think there's a lot of... Um, concern that you know your work is not always recognizable or whatever but I think the experimentation part is is so important As, like I said I love to teach and so I have taught around the world and I enjoy meeting people and it, it expands my world it expands everything um, in my own you know I live in a very small town so <laughs> when I get to travel to Mexico or New Zealand or Wichita Kansas it's like it's amazing for me I, I love it so invite me again please <laughs> Just a quick run through some art history here because I, I feel like when, you know, there are a lot of people in the, in the general public who will come into a show like this and be like, I don't get it, or my three-year-old can do this, and, you know, we all know that's not true, but we don't know why that's not true. 
So I want to give a quick run through art history. And the question is, what is abstract art and how did we get here? In other words, the show that we're looking at right now. Vasily Kandinsky said, the more frightening the world becomes, the more art becomes abstract. Well, who is Vasily Kandinsky? OK, well, he's, he's probably the reason why we're here, or one of the reasons. He's a Russian painter. Uh, he is considered the founder of Western abstraction. After studying many styles, he eventually broke things down to three building blocks, line, shape, and color. He wrote concerning the spiritual in art. So here's his timeline of his lifetime, 1866 through 1944. And when I did this preparation for this talk, I was kind of blown away because I realized that he was kind of born around the time of the Impressionists, but he died after abstract expressionism, which explained why he was such an important person in the history of art. Now, I circled expressionism, constructivism, Dada, and the Bauhaus where he taught, and abstract expressionism because his theories influenced these modern movements in the 20th century. So if you take away him, you take away uh, an awful lot of uh, influence. So he is uh, a very major player. So let's move on to something we all know, and that is Impressionism. Uh, everybody knows Impressionism. Uh, Vasily Kandinsky was inspired by the Impressionists. The Impressionists faced harsh opposition as they moved away from realism. And they were interested in the effects of light. Around this time in history, the scientists were discovering rods and cones, right? So art, in this instance, was in line with science. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes art's ahead of science. Sometimes science is ahead of art. But in this case, they were synced together, which makes it really fascinating. So the Impressionists often worked plein air because they were interested in the effects of light. Then came post-Impressionism. And look at all the different styles here. Uh, we've got Paul Gauguin, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Cezanne, Georges Seurat. Um, so you've got everything from symbolism like Gauguin all the way to expressive work like Van Gogh and the scientific pointillism of Seurat. So the reaction against, this is a reaction against Impressionism's natural depiction of light and color. And look at, again, the, the many stylistic variations uh, from science all the way to the symbolism lasting uh, from 1886 to 1905. This is Fauvism, and uh, if you notice the colors, Fauvism in French means wild beasts. And so if you look at the images, you can see how bright the colors are. I mean, the tree trunks are orange, and the grass is blue or yellow. This is not local color. So wild beasts, non-representative, and this was a, a pretty powerful movement, especially you know if you guys look at the exhibition. And the reason I'm going through these isms is because for anybody who's wondering why something looks the way it does, we need to look at what came before us. Artists are not trying to recreate in uh, any of these former movements. Um, but we don't live in a vacuum. We are, we, you know, we try to be educated about what went before us because we ourselves are trying to find where we are and maybe we'll recreate our own movement. So then uh, the next one would be expressionism. Uh, this was Vasily Kandinsky's, the one that was right smack dab in the middle of his life. So his image is on the left, and then we have Paul Clay and Kathy Kolwitz, Ed Edward Munch, and Egon Schiele. Uh, a lot of things became very distorted, as you can see in Ed Edward Munch's painting. It was a time for emotional experience versus reality, and it was a reaction against Impressionism and academic art. So a lot of these isms that we might think were you know, we readily accept them now, they were oftentimes expressing something against the previous time period. And yes? I have a question. So I, the previous one was very short lived, it was like eight years. Mm -hmm. and this one is um, 28 years. So what do you think that was the, the, the length of the sharpness of the period of that style, however, that led to that change? I mean, so you're talking about the individualism itself? I mean, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the number of people involved in the movement, uh, how popular or unpopular were they? 
Good question, though. Now, cubism is interesting. Um, notice the geometry in, in Pablo Picasso's piece, as well as George Brock. Those were the two uh, main people that we really relate to in cubism. And then when you look at this exhibition, you'll notice the geometry right in the show and this breaking of planes, the breaking into shapes. Pablo Picasso and George Brock, this is like the most influential art movement of the 20th century. Uh, it was inspired by Cezanne, who, if you look back at his work in Impressionism, had those fractionated small shapes pioneered by Picasso and Brock. But I've got these little lines showing that this one movement spun off into suprematism, futurism, Dadaism, constructivism, and Art Deco. So it's huge, uh, the influence here. Now, Dadaism is uh, the next slide. And this is the absurd anti-art movement. So I didn't see anything in this particular exhibition that reminded me too much of uh, what we see here. Nonetheless, this was a movement that these artists were fed up with the world and disillusioned. They were artists after World War I, so imagine they were just you know, very frustrated. And they essentially said, screw this, and began making art that ridiculed art that came before it and any rational thought. As you can see, its purpose was to shock, confuse, and outrage. Then came uh, surrealism, and uh, we saw some of that today, right? And this movement, uh, Andre Breton, Rene Magritte, Salvador Dali, Max Ernst, this period was influenced by the work of uh, psychologist Sigmund Freud and the unconscious, the dream state and desire. Uh, combines disparate elements, dreamlike compositions. So a very important movement that has influenced many artists of today. Then we move on to probably what might be one of the, the biggest influences of uh, abstract art today, abstract expressionism. We've got kind of two, two different areas here. We've got action painting, so Arshiel Gorky, Willem de Kooning, Lee Krasner, and Jackson Pollock. Their paintings are full of diagonals, right? Lots of energy, lots of movement. But we also, on the other side, have color field painting. Much more calm, fewer shapes, lots of geometry. So Joseph Albers, Mark Rothko, Helen Frankenthaler, and Clifford Steele. Very famous artists that you've probably heard of. And then... Okay, hard edge painting. This is actually something I discovered in, in, as I was preparing for this presentation. I wasn't aware of it, but when I saw it, it made total sense. And uh, Ellsworth Kelly, Frank Stella, uh, this is a move away. Notice the difference between the abstract expressionists with this, these gestural movements, and now we've got the economy of form, often geometric, and flat, solid color. Then we move on to pop art. Uh, Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup Can. You know, you might laugh at that, but I remember watching a documentary about Andy Warhol, and I was really impressed. The reason, uh, uh, yeah, you're nodding your head. The reason for the tomato can, uh, tomato soup, is that he lived with his mother, and he literally had Campbell's Soup every single day of his life, you know? But, well, when you hear that, though, it's like, well, why wouldn't the guy multiply that by about 100 and then make that his art? So artists wanted to represent the real world, popular and commercial culture. And then in response to that came minimalism. Uh, minimalist work expresses the essentials or identity of a subject. It eliminates all non-essential forms, features, or concepts. So some representative artists, Robert Morris, Agnes Martin, and Sol LeWitt, there is no attempt uh, made to represent an outside reality. The medium and the material are the reality. For those of you asking about the, uh, the dark uh, piece uh, in, in the show, that is an example of minimalism and very well done. So in this next slide, this slide is to show you that the green that goes off to the left with the arrows is modern art. It's Impressionism through 1970s, and it's all about individuality. The red marks that go off to the right with the arrows bring us to the current time period, and they're about expression, freedom, and social impact, and they go from the minimalism time period, conceptual art, all the way to the present time. That's where we are right now. Okay, so where are we today? 
21st century art is informed by the past, living in the present, contemplating the future. The mediums are from traditional oil on canvas to TV, film, digital, comics, fashion, fiber, and AI generated. The themes, they can be politics, power, technology, science, ideology, religion, feminism, gender, freedom, environment, human interaction, social impact, etc. So we have a lot of information from the past to inform the present here. Vasily Kardinsky said, there's only one road to follow, that of analysis of the basic elements in order to arrive ultimately at an adequate graphic expression. Uh, this is a work, a lovely work by Tony Blake in the show. I wanted to feature some of the work in these slides. Uh, this work is also in the show by Paula Christensen. Art is not what you can see, but what you can make others see. Edgar Degas. And then four more artists. I love these slides because I was able to, to choose art from the show. It was really fun to uh, feature some of their art. Yanming Chen, A.F. Brockton, Chad Erpelding, and Karen Bopp. Art is a form of communication. All artists use their own personal visual language of art comprised of the design elements and principles which apply to all genres. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what it was like to curate the show. And uh, the first thing, uh, all the artists who submitted, all uh, 978 works, have what's called a prospectus, and they had to follow these guidelines. Really important to do that. So if you were a uh, North American artist, which included US or Canada, you could enter the show. It was open to amateurs or professionals, art created in the past two years. All the entries could not have previously been exhibited in Wichita, Kansas, metro area. Open to 2D and 3D, but no video. And each artist could submit up to four pieces. And the submission process was robust, I think. They had 978 entries. So I, I wanted to just go over, um, from, I guess from my vantage point, what it's like to jury a show with so many entries. So um, I'm just gonna briefly talk about kind of what, what I was thinking. And I had several rounds, I, I call them a round. Round one was an overview, my first impression. It was a blind jurying process, so I did not see names of any artists. I didn't know where they came from. All I could see was the image, the dimensions, the medium, the date. And with one additional click, I could see the artist statement, but in the first round, I just couldn't even go there. Like, that was way too much information. So, yeah, no names or prices could be seen. My goal was to get a lay of the land. What are the mediums? What are the styles? What's the level of experience? And what are the sizes of work? My observations were that there was a predominance of 2D work, very few sculptures. I wanted to have a good representation of all mediums, both 2D and 3D. My options, which I could change, when you see a slide come by, it's either a yes, no, or maybe. In round one, my, here's my result. The majority of works went into the maybe category. I had very few yeses. If they were a yes on round one, they were exceptional on so many levels, skill, vision, everything. I had very few no's. Uh, a no, an immediate no would be a very poor quality digital slide. Perhaps it was a skew, or I saw like the bread and the bananas behind their painting, or a chair, um, yeah, the cat, um, cat fur. So just a, a note, you know, please take really good slides. And in very rare cases, if I thought the caliber of work was exceptional in spite of a poor image, it still went into the maybe category. I mean, rounds two, three, and four, I was able to uh, take a closer look. And my processor goal was to curate a diverse cross-section of mediums and styles that represent excellence in contemporary abstract art. Now, the mediums uh, were really impressive in terms of like the diversity. Acrylics, watercolor, oils, collage, ceramics, metal, sculpture, fiber, embroidery, photography, graphite, pastel, glass, 3D photography, printmaking, and encaustic. That is a wide variety. Uh, my selections were informed by art history, both past and present. I was asked to choose 85 works out of 978. That was a daunting task. The work here, upper left, is Emily Kirby. Upper right is Matthew Hartfield. And on the bottom is Linda J. Kane. 
who is in our audience. Yay! In rounds two, three, and four, I focused on standout work. Work that held my focus and attention caused me to pause or stop for longer periods of time, and I began choosing a cross-section of mediums and sizes. That's important, sizes, because notice in the exhibition that when you walk in, it's not all like large work, it's not all small work. I wanted scale to play a part in this. So a diverse representation of exceptional submissions. So what did I consider high caliber? Emotional impact is high in the list. Compositional strength is high in the list. Vulnerability, these are all actually high in my list. Exceptional technical skill or competence. Risk taking, attention to detail, sensitivity, complexity versus simplicity, and a, a sense of confidence. The artist had an intent, conviction of voice. By the end of round four, I was able to narrow it down from 978 to 130 works. That was a wish list of sorts, and this painting is by Taylor McQuarrie. By end of round five, I narrowed it down from 130 to 85. This was extremely difficult because I had to remove 40-some pieces. So if your work was not included, have heart. If there had been a bit more space here at Mark Arts, um, perhaps your work would have been included. And to continue moving uh, toward 85, I asked myself, were, were these pieces, you know, what's memorable? Uh, what's leaving a lasting impression? And while the art, for the most part, spoke for itself, the artist statements now became important in many instances. Artists who can write about their art as well as create it enhance the level of communication between artwork and the viewer. And several amazing works had to be eliminated as they were outside the two-year window specified in the prospectus. In fact, one of them almost became an award winner until I saw the date, and I had to remove it. So now, let's talk about the award winners. Um, I just want to congratulate everybody again for you know your work, um, getting into the show, or submitting. The award winners um, were was really tough because there was so much wonderful work. I want to read a little uh, part of Christine Molly's uh, artist statement here. My art has a primitive, raw, and earthy feel to it. My mixed media paintings are the outcome of a process akin to an archaeological excavation. Um, this piece is called The Lighthouse. It's mixed media. And I chose this for first place because I think of all 978 submissions, it hit me emotionally, OK? And the reason for that is the life I've led. So while any one of you might come into this show and pick a different winner, and, and that's, that's going to happen, right? Um, this is a personal choice because it spoke to me in the way that it was um, a monoch pretty monochromatic palette. Um, to me, it, it kind of spoke of sorrow and somberness. It was the economy of the mark making. I mean, I love marks, but here there's like restraint. And uh, the, the little portions of blue, the little bits of saturation, just so delicately and sensitively put in there, to me, that was a sense of risk and vulnerability as well. That was like the one that I never equivocated about. I want to congratulate Christine Molly on that piece. <laughs> Second place went to Nicholas Costner. This piece also, I just found it to be really colorful. It is called Party Crashing, and he writes, I spent countless hours building details and refining colors. I'm exploring the possibilities within the chaos I've created and attempting to make sense of it. I felt that. Anybody who's ever mixed color, if you look at the, the variety, the diversity, the tints, tones, and shades of color, the placement, I mean, it, it's so meticulously done. The edges are perfect. There's not an uh, imperfect edge in this, this piece. This is an example of the hard edge painting. And I, I really just have respect for anyone who can do that. And, and I, I love the colors. I felt like it was dancing. It was uh, uplifting. It was beautiful colors. Third place is, um, this is punch embroidery. I'd never seen this medium before. I've seen embroidery, but I, I, I had to read a little bit of the artist statement to understand this piece. And this is by Delaney O'Connor. And she wrote, the textures and micro patterns in the thread work accent the idea that there is no definable limit from where the fabric that we wear ends and our inner, more personal and emotional inner weavings begin. These works aim to call attention to our perceptions of ourselves 
as well as how we perceive and pass judgment on others. So it's called Aren't You Embarrassed? It's a punch needle embroidery, pretty large scale. And so uh, again, I, I think I was really moved by the palette being um, a monochromatic palette the artist statement definitely played a role in this piece because it helped me understand who this person was. When it came to the awards, I, I really needed to dive into the artist statements and understand not just the visual communication, but the verbal. The two together completed that final message to me and uh, they, they, they really went together and I think the artist statement had to be pretty strong in order for these artists to earn an award. So now, we move on to the honorable mention, and uh, the first choice I had was Regina Free, and uh, skull, and man skull with Mannequin in Graphite on Paper. Reconstructing a deconstructed reality is the theme of my work. Dismantling what is perceived creates an opportunity for a surreal peek behind the veil, an insight into our subconscious biases that draw the boundaries of truth. With the removal of these self-imposed restrictions, we release what is possible. I was truly blown away by this piece. I looked at it for a really long time. Um, the composition is, is so powerful. The technique itself is impeccable. The amount of negative space around the skull and the mannequin um, allow you to appreciate the graphite drawing. It can breathe, and I, I felt like it was just um, labored upon and loved. You know, I, I had that feeling, and so I want to congratulate her as well. Then we have Marilyn Bradley, honorable mention. Uh, she wrote, the many moods are created by the relationship between glowing light and dark patterns. Design and vibrant colors dominate the perception of the composition. This is called Stairway to Whatever. It's a watercolor, and uh, having done watercolor for uh, a good decade or so, watercolor is a, a medium that I, I understand, and it's very complex, very difficult, uh, very unforgiving. And so when I saw this, what I, I think what really hit me was the composition was really interesting in that the, that dark band on the left, it's not completely dark. You know, you can see there's a little bit of, of value variation, color variation and just the, the technical ability here with washes, transparency, and the control of the medium I thought was really, really spectacular. And our last honorable mention is Neil Cox. So this, this one <laughs> really appeals to my left brain. <laughs> so he writes, composed of circles circumscribed within grid squares or triangles. The Counting Grid series draws on an experimental meditative game, starting with one circle, followed by a space, then two circles and a space, and ascending up to a predetermined number of circles in a row. The sequence descends until there is just one circle. I can't really wrap my head around that. Um, <laughs> oh, did, did you? Okay, well. <laughs> Starting with 71 uh, on 140, it's a lithograph. And this medium too, um, I mean, it just sort of like, it, it kind of rung a bell for me because I learned lithography when we lived in London for a year. And I, I just remember how difficult it was. We had to, you know, etch uh, an aluminum plate. I'm not, well, actually it, it, we used aluminum, but he, he might've used stone because that's what lithograph, litho is stone. So it is a print, but I, I was fascinated by the thought process behind this, you know, and I've seen other artists do this with mathematics and other ways to think about art and the art is spectacular. So in conclusion, I just want to say that um, art is a form of communication. Abstraction invites the audience to see and feel the connections. Is the artwork a mirror when you look at it? Is it a bridge? Is it a familiar place? Look at the art and see what you feel and seek out ways that you may connect. As you view the work in this amazing exhibition, if you can strike up a conversation with the artists about their work, you will both be enlightened. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions about anything? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have not juried any other shows. I hope it won't be my last. So that's a great question.
If you know of anyone who wants a juror, let me know. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm glad because it was really hard. Yeah, we need a new recliner after all that work. I sat there for a long time. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Can you expand a little bit on? Um, I might be pretty out track, but what risk taking? When? How do you recognize risk taking? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think it's partly when when you look at any work, um, especially in the exhibition. Um, or if you look at, say, some of these um, isms of the past, right? And I, I, I forever never understood minimalism, for example, right? Um, because I remember as a younger person seeing the white square in, in the white square, and I thought, you know, what is this, right? But that's risk, uh, very risky. And that person was responding to a former movement. Um, and a lot of times when you see something you don't understand, it, it's very important to look, I think, to the past and see what came before it. So risk to me is um, minimalism for sure, because you always ask yourself, is this enough? I, there was one piece submitted that had like just this gorgeous calligraphic mark. And I definitely saw that as risk. You know, It could be that you have a composition where the, the weight, the feeling of gravity is not, you normally see the feeling of gravity on the bottom of a painting, but in this case, it's on the top. Now, is that intentional or is that a mistake? <laughs> is this painting accidentally hung upside down or presented upside down so that the gravity is not on the top? Or is that intentional? Um, uh, so imbalance can be um, another form of risk. Yeah, does that answer your question? OK, anybody else? Yes? As far as your time with doing biochemistry, I mean, I do have you know, kind of switched gears in recent years, and I've done a lot of different things. Did you find it hard to go from something that was so rigid into something that is so subjective? I mean, I mean were you working uh, artistically while you were <laughs> living? You know? No, no. I, when, I was work, when I was trying to get my biochemistry degree, I lived in the library, ate a lot of McDonald's food in a dark, you know, part of the library. I never came up for air. <laughs> I, yeah, it was not a good time for me because uh, my brain was um, not geared toward that, you know. So I, I kind of dropped everything and it, it just wasn't a good situation. So, um, but what came out of that was the realization that um, I needed art to heal. And that was a great realization, so. For that, I, I don't have any regrets. I'm glad I did the biochemistry first. Okay, well thank you everybody.